So for this bonus objective, I wanted to look at feature film adaptations to TV or video game media from like the late 80s to mid 90s. And out of all of them, Space Jam got picked. So come on and slam, and welcome to the jam. Come on and slam. Now you wouldn't think it, unless you were around for it, but this movie was pretty much inspired solely on the aspect of commercialism. From the early 90s, Nike featured a few commercials that blended characters from the Looney Tunes with basketball superstar Michael Jordan. On their own, they were pretty funny and likely done to attract kids who were into cartoons to try and get them into basketball. After all, most 90s kids were all about cartoons and sports stars. These ads were also attempts to modernize the iconic Looney Tunes characters, since while reruns were fine and all, Warner Brothers wanted to update them for a new generation of viewers. That's how the idea for a movie lingered at the time. Joe Pitka, who was famous for directing over 80 commercials for the Super Bowl, including the Hair Jordan commercials, was brought along to try and make the movie, starring Michael Jordan as himself, a reality. What came of this is a movie that, as many have said before me, is a commercial for a commercial. It's really just a larger attempt to sell shoes to children that want to play sports. But you know, the idea of splicing live-action characters with cartoon characters is always a novel concept, so what makes this as enjoyable to a lot of people, and why does it still matter today? Well, get yourself a Pepsi, kick off your Air Jordans, and snack on a double quarter pound king. For this is Space Jam. We start out with... I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. Oh, right. I should probably get this out of the way now. This song, which is one of the highlights of the movie, was made by R. Kelly who has been charged with many damning cases related to sexual abuse. While this one song is really good and great inspirational material, its existence does not change the sort of person he is. Anyway, little Michael really wants to play college and professional basketball when he grows up, and maybe even pick up baseball like his father did. It's an okay heart-to-heart -heart moment that leads to the transition to our opening song. be real so far. If you've never seen or heard of this movie until now, would you honestly believe this has anything to do with the Looney Tunes? I mean, sure, one of the credits shows Bugs freaking Bunny, but aside from that detail, this opening feels more something from a docudrama, since we're seeing highlights of Jordan's life and career as a basketball player. Plus, along with that opening scene of Little Michael, the next scene shows an adult Michael announcing his retirement from the NBA so he can take up baseball. Is that my father had the opportunity to see me play my last basketball game, and you know, that means a lot to me. What are you going to do now? Well, I've never really told anybody this, except for one person, and... Uh, but I think I'm gonna go and play professional baseball. Now this scene is very well in reference to his father's death during a failed carjacking. This affected his decision to stop playing basketball and take up the game that his father taught him to play. The murder is obviously not as implied here, since this is a kid's movie, but otherwise the movie has been mostly accurate with the details on Jordan's life up to that point. So now let's immediately break from history by jumping to space where it becomes animated for some reason, before we see... Oof, that CG hasn't aged well at all. More importantly, this confirms the existence of... Let's get out of here, Dad. Aliens. Don't bring me here anymore, right? Are you listening? Did you hear him? Did you hear him? So here we have Danny DeVito playing a business tycoon named Mr. Swackhammer. 
He is looking to spruce up his trash heap of an amusement park so he can make money. Well, you know how it is. If you can't think of something original, turn the television. Yes! Looney! Yes! Now you're talking! Looney! Looney, that's it! That's the word I was looking for! <laughs> Looney, get the Looney Tunes! Looney Tunes! Well, I know Six Flags used to have mascot costumes of them. If you're willing to raid one of their closets for- what if they can't come? What did you say? What if they can't come? Make them. Cool. Make them! Are they implying the tunes are real? Please, everyone knows they're just characters drawn on paper or on a computer. Right? Anyway, back on Earth, we see that Michael is apparently not very good at baseball, even when he gets help from the opposing catcher, since he autographed a basketball for his kid. Slider, don't swing. Strike me! I told you how to swing. I couldn't help it. I understand. Hey, nice talking to ya! Of course, it seems like everyone's just trying to cheer him up, since he's a former superstar, after all. To that end, he's given Stan Podolak, played by Wayne Knight, to act as his new publicist. He's kind of funny, even if he's given such dumb lines like, Come on, Michael, it's game time. Get your Hanes on, lace up your Nikes, grab your Wheaties and your Gatorade, and we'll pick up a Big Mac on the way to the ballpark. Oddly enough, we still get actors like Bill Murray and Celtics basketball icon Larry Bird to play themselves and be part of Michael's friends. Guess Wayne Knight wasn't important enough to keep his existence. Speaking of existence, they see a spacecraft shoot by and inexplicably brush it off. The ship then dives through a Piggly Wiggly. Careful, I need my next movie from there. I don't see why they needed to go underground for this, when the tunnel to Toontown is literally just behind the Acme Corporation. Oh, there he is! The star, the main character, the best tune ever! I'll uh, be with you in a second, folks, after I finish with Nature Boy here. <laughs> oh, wait, you pesky wabbit! I've got you now! <laughs> Ouch! Heh. <laughs> so how's Bugs going to get away from the... Nerd Lux. Okay. Bugs Bunny. Bugs Bunny. Say, does he have uh, great big long ears? Like this? Yeah! yeah. Okay. Well, uh, does he say, what's up, Doc? Like this? Eh, what's up, Doc? Yeah! <laughs> nope. Never heard of him. I should mention that Billy West provides the voice of Bugs and Elmer in this movie, and in other media. We have a star-studded voice acting cast suitable for the more recognizable tunes of the movie, like D. Bradley Baker as Daffy Duck, Bob Bergen as Porky, Tweety, and Marvin the Martian, Bill Farmer as Sylvester, Foghorn Leghorn, and Yosemite Sam, and yes, even June Foray returns as Granny. Anyway, the Nerd Lux aren't so easily fooled, and they force Bugs to call all the tunes to meet them. And I do mean all of them. Meep, meep. Oh, stop this cartoon. We've got an emergency cartoon character a union meeting to go to. So, yeah, I guess what they see as a cartoon is just their daily life on repeat. Just like in Rocky and Bullwinkle. So even though there are hundreds of tunes and only five aliens, their blasters are way too powerful to fight against. But Bugs, being ever resourceful, convinces the Nerd Lux to follow the rules and let the tunes defend themselves. Even now, the style of humor isn't too different from the style of the old years. For the most part, anyway. So, how are you gonna stop them now that you got them to listen? Small arms. Short legs. Not belly fast. Tiny little guys. I, I can't jump high. Uh... We challenge you to a basketball game. Convenient! Beats my option of playing golf. Of course, for fairness sake, they have to show the aliens an old film on how the game works. But the Nerdlucks do show some confidence in their ability to win, 
and they go to a real basketball game between the Knicks and the Suns, disguise themselves with the best TMNT trench coat they could find, and plot something. Also, hi Homer! Does Marge know you're hanging with Deborah Barone? So they can turn into liquid like when you drink Capri Sun? And by going inside Charles Barkley, the orange nerd luck makes him dazed and confused? What? Wow! He did it! I got it. I got his talent. Oh, wow. Uh, I see. You must use the same talent stealing tech as the ultimate despair. And then the other aliens steal the basketball talents of four other players. Sean Bradley, Patrick Ewan, Larry Johnson, and Muggsy Bogues. And when we do see them back in the Looney Tunes world, when they go to practice, we get to see them channel the power of the magic ball! Okay, admit it, everyone who saw this literally freaked out at how scary and awesome they look. I love how smooth the transformation scene was, and I know I haven't really talked about the animation for this movie that much, but a lot of it is well done for the time. It has good coloring, pace, and comedic timing. Hey, little pig. Boo. Ah! I able to wet myself. Well, I did say the style worked most of the time. Bye bye. Yeah, I think we might need a little bit of help. Okay, before we continue, let's rewind a bit to scenes that Michael was in. His scenes thus far were irrelevant to the overall plot, and just relate to him dealing with his new career. It doesn't come off as interesting, even when it tries to be funny. Well, he went two for five and lost 32 points in his batting average. Yeah. yeah, so that puts him at like a 685 or something. What? His acting is rather wooden, which is to be expected from athletes with little prior acting experience. Many in the 90s had to see Shaquille O'Neal act in a few bad movies, but as much as I hate to admit it, even he has more charisma than Jordan in at least one of them. Cause I am Kazam. Who may? I'm more than I seem. You all are looking at your dream. In your coffee, I'm the queen. These Michael scenes are a rather bland offset to the Looney Tunes stuff, since it just feels like the writers wanted to make his story more relatable and realistic. But in doing so, they lose focus on the more interesting stuff happening elsewhere. In this sense, having him act like this would make a lot of sense. But since we know he will meet the tunes at some point, it's going to be quite the contrast from his normal acting self. So he goes golfing with Bill Murray and Larry Bird. Bill asks Michael if he can play in the NBA now that some players lost their talent, only to be shot down. It's a silly conversation to be sure, but what really matters is Bugs using a magnet to lure Michael's ball into the hole for a hole-in-one. Just so they can do this. Thanks, Sam! You can be a great help to the rabbit when you really want to! But I hate rabbits. Look out for that toy step, Doc. It's a real Lulu. Bugs Bunny. Eh, uh, you were expecting maybe the Easter Bunny? You're a cartoon, you're not real. Like I said, his reactions are rather... subdued. Even after falling into another world. And after being subjected to all manner of looniness. Which I find... hilarious. Now let's see what we got inside here. You lay who? They are. All right. He's okay. 
What's going on here? So he's given the plot that the Looney Tunes need his help in winning a basketball game to avoid enslavement from the aliens. And that the Tunes kidnapped him specifically since he's a really good basketball player. Well, used to be. But Bugs and friends are willing to help get his groove back once they refurbish their personal gym. There's nothing here a little spitshine wouldn't fix. Spitshine! Spitshine! <laughs> 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 Fresh. Nice to see they attempted a mixture of a CG, 2D, and real-life set piece. It did not age well. It's especially noticeable when the Monstars show up. Like, there are good background sets to be had, but the CG stuff doesn't hold up or blend well with the tunes themselves. And then you get stuff like this that's just... I don't even know. You guys make a big mistake. You're all washed up, Baldy. Baldy? He is not washed up. Michael's the greatest ever. Shut up. No. You okay? Yeah, are you okay? Hey. hey. Whoops. You're not scared of them, are you, Michael? Yeah, you can insult him all you want, but you hurt Tweety, then it's on. Let's play some basketball. Yeah. And then we get a really awkward sequence involving the five affected NBA stars failing to recover their basketball skills while some slow music plays. Maybe that's why he can't sleep at night. And it climbed up my back and into my brain. Are there any other areas besides basketball where you find yourself yeah. unable to perform? Yeah, yeah. It doesn't add anything to the story other than serving as a break from the action. Stan's still trying to reach Michael ever since he got sucked down the hole. When we do return to the tunes, we see that they do not know anything past their tune instincts. Has anyone here ever played basketball? Um, I have. I'd like to try out for the team. Yeah, it was about time we got to this point. Lola Bunny, voiced by Kath Susie, was a tune created for Space Jam, who would appear in other Looney Tunes media, often as a potential love interest for Bugs. You could argue she was made to give representation to the female demographic, since there are female basketball players out there. They could have gotten another basketball star to get along with Michael, but what can you do? Putting aside her design, which feels a bit more sexualized by Looney Tunes standards, I understand that her humor with Bugs harkens back to one of Tex Avery's old cartoons, Red Hot Riding Hood, which made fun of the social norm that saw women as pin-up girls and men as lustful douchebags. I got it, I got it. <laughs> the girl's got some skills. Yes. Don't ever call me. Doll. It doesn't quite work as well here, though, since she's not in this movie a whole lot, at least dialogue-wise. Of course, I think we get more of the tunes than we of Michael, as he sends Bugs and Daffy off to get his gear from his house. Some fourth wall humor then ensues. You think she's got enough toys? Speaking of toys, you know all those mugs and uh, t-shirts and lunchboxes with our pictures on them? Yeah? You uh, ever see any money from all that stuff? <laughs> Not a cent. Mm, me neither. <sighs> it's a crying shame. We gotta get new agents. We're getting screwed. You know, that's a good point. Does Warner Brothers know anything about them? And what I think is the only time I find Michael's family a good addition, the kids see the two tunes and help get Michael's shorts from their dog. It doesn't have much purpose, other than they know where their dad is, but I sort of liked how it came out. Not so much are the five doofuses attempting to get their talent back and learning the plot through a seer. Your talent to win a basketball game against Bugs Bunny. At any rate, once Michael puts his stuff on, he starts playing like a natural again. Guess he really wasn't washed up, though I don't know how long he's been absent from the NBA in this timeline. Oh, and because Stan saw Bugs and Daffy go down the hole, 
He followed them, and now he's here too. He still wants to help, even if he's not great. Oh, and because the five washouts lost their talent, the NBA is shutting down due to health concerns? It's just five guys! Nothing else has happened since! This isn't a COVID-19 situation or anything, you're overblowing this! But hey, it's okay, the Game and Tune world is coming up, and everyone is getting pumped! Looking good, Michael! I'd say the size of the stadium and the amount of tunes present is good, but I think they might have duplicated some of them. Penelope in particular. Oh, and Mr. Swackhammer is watching as well. About time he showed up again. Guys, let's just go out and have fun. Yeah! The challengers for the ultimate game, all the way from Moron Mountain, the Mar Well, it's all been building to this. Let's see how their A game is. Well, we're boned. So while Michael and Lola are competent enough to score against five mountains of muscle, the other tunes aren't really able to keep up with the overpowered monster folk who could literally jump to the basket from half court if they really wanted. It gets to the point that by halftime, they're down big. During intermission, Stan ends up learning where the aliens got their powers from. And after recovering from his beating from the Monstars, he tells the Toons what he knows. I think we should quit forfeit. Yeah, listen. I didn't get dragged down here just to get my butt whipped by a bunch of ugly Monstars. I ain't going out like that. We're letting them push us around. We gotta fight them back. We gotta take it to them. We gotta get right in their faces. And what do you say? Are you with me or not? Sorry, Michael, but your speechcraft is way too low. So it's bugs to the rescue. <laughs> Deltoid, play along. Hey, stop hogging it, Mike. We're your teammates. Self-confidence? Nah, clearly it's the juice. Well, it works, as the second half begins with everyone kicking ass, using their tune hijinks, which a lot of it is pretty funny. Ooh, this will be good. <laughs> So, Swackhammer gets pissy and wants to get Michael for his amusement park. But since Michael knows about the stolen talent, he decides to raise the stakes by offering himself as a prize for if they lose. But if they win, the aliens have to return the stolen talent. But if Michael were to lose, what would they do with him? You'll be our star attraction. You'll sign autographs all day long and play one-on-one -on -one with the paying customers. <laughs> and you'll always lose. Wouldn't that just devalue his worth as a basketball star? Your guests will eventually get bored and move on. Well, the deal is made, and Swackhammer tells the Monstars to start playing more physically. I mean, the tunes were kind of cheating with their shenanigans, so it's kind of fair? Uh-oh, Lola's about to be crushed! Save her, Bugs! Oh my, Bugs! Bugs! Is this your man? Are you okay? Me? Oh yeah, I'm fine. Are you okay? Oh, Bugs. Thank you. Aw, oh, it was nothing. Well, at this point, the Toon Squad really do feel defeated. Even after Michael tells them that the secret stuff they took was really water. So it's up to Stan to get in and do something. Mother of, I'll be all over him like a cheap suit. 
I'll be on him like stick on rice. I tell you, he's going down. Yeah, that's nice and all, but look! The Dover Boys! Which means Dora is alone and unprotected! And yeesh! Flandon Stan is ugly! Seeing him inflated is... just as ugly. By the way, when this happened, the Toon Squad was down 10 points. But after the Toons finish carting Stan off the court, the score shows they're down one point with 10 seconds left in the game. Did we miss a scene? Anyway, the Toon Squad needs a fifth player to avoid disqualification. So who do they turn to? Whoa, whoa, whoa! I didn't know Dan Aykroyd was in this picture! What? I don't get it. Update! Turns out, both Dan and Bill were in Ghostbusters! So he couldn't tell them apart? I don't know. Yeah, we don't know how he's here, even when he attempts to explain it, but he's getting his I was born to do this moment by being the white savior that will help bring a little more strategy to this game. It's gut check time. This must be mine. Brick and white people. Anyway, now for the big moment. After the game, Bill wraps up his subplot by deciding not to try out for the NBA. Guess once you tasted fame, you might as well retire a champ. As for the Monstars... Why you take it from this guy? Because he's bigger. He's bigger than we used to be. What are you doing? Hey, wait, come here. What are you doing? Wait, what? What? With that, Michael convinces the Monstars to honor their bargain and return the stolen talent. Michael has to leave for another baseball game, but not before having a heartful goodbye. You guys got a lot of vibes. Uh, a lot of vibes. Yeah. Well, whatever it is, you got a lot of <laughs> Bugs? Hey, Mike? Stay out of trouble. You know I will. <laughs> Come here. <laughs> And that was the last of that version of Lola, at least for now. Michael returns via the Nerd Lux's spaceship, while the song from the beginning plays again. We don't get to see if his baseball game improved, since we shift to the next day when Michael tells the dumbass players to touch his magic ball. What's that? I like that, Mike. Hey, hey I caught it! find out. And there you go, the reason that Michael returned to the NBA. Not because of the MLB strike at the time, coupled with his refusal to be a replacement player, but because the Looney Tunes gave him his motivation back. What's the matter, Bill? Larry, that could have been me. We get off that kick. It's over. It's done with it. You can't play. So and Space Jam. A messy commercial in the form of a movie. But it was a fun mess of a movie. 
Mostly because of the Looney Tunes, though. Really, I find it amusing that the one premise they could go with, a basketball player playing basketball with cartoon characters against space aliens, was able to work at all despite... many other factors. Michael felt bland in his own movie, and didn't really shine as the inspirational player they set him up as. The random humor from the real world didn't really gel well with the animated parts, and some plot elements felt pointless or tacked on. While the 2D animated stuff works well in a lot of areas, even when they appear in the real world, some effects, notably the CG effects, felt really dated and probably wouldn't have looked good even back then. At the very least, the, Lo the Looney Tunes had plenty of good material to go on to where I was constantly laughing or giggling at their antics. There was at least effort in trying to update them, not perfect, but I wouldn't call that bad. This wasn't going to be anything groundbreaking, even if it did get nominated for various awards. This was just an extended shoe commercial with some product placement based on another line of commercials. It's goofy enough that it does deserve its cult following and a place in animation history. What does interest me even more is that a sequel might be in the works. It's set for July 2021, and will star LeBron James, since Michael didn't want to come back for it. If it does actually come out, you better believe I'll pay to see it. Even if it flops, it'll still be something to talk about. For now though, the original will always be that odd gem in movie history. It's not the best looking gem, and many will find it unappealing and for good reason, but for everyone else, it's just something worth having around. I'm the Media Hunter. Media is my prey, and reviewing them my way.